I, uh, you guys hear this from me every year. I love to see so many people serving at the church rummer sale. Isn't that wonderful? You just show up and there's people here, there's people there. The day before, John's out there mowing. Everywhere you go, uh, Dad was working a lot, really hard, making that weed patch, formerly known as the garden, uh, look a little better uh, for those who came by. I love to see people serve. That's one of the things that blesses my heart. I come here and somebody's vacuuming the floor, or, or uh, I, I, I see after a service somebody's downstairs washing dishes, and it's beautiful. It is lovely to see hands that are at work for the Lord. It's, it's a wonderful thing to see uh, people sweating because they're, they're, they're out there trying to love God and love people, to see people going out of their way to be a blessing. Uh, the Rum Sale is one of our annual community outreach events. It's a, it's a way to invite people uh, to get them through our doors, right, and into our family. And I want you to know, everybody, I'm really proud of you. Really proud of all of you uh, who worked hard in this event. Uh, of course, being proud of you is a special state for me. I, I walk around pretty much proud of this church all the time, which is, which is a blessing. Uh, I see, again, the mowing, the shoveling. I, I can still remember uh, Michaela grabbing a, a, a rake and, and getting the leaves done uh, before the rest of us even got out there almost. A cleaning, serving through music. When I see people standing up here, there are different teams of different people cycling through, leading a Sunday school class, uh, doing the slides at the back, a weekly small groups, any number of ways. I don't take any of that for granted. I say, thank you, God. I love to see your body working. I love to see your people serving. I love it. I love it. When we pray together, when we enjoy fellowship together, when we eat snacks together, when we watch football together, it often strikes me, and I'm not joking, this is the finest team that I've ever had the privilege of being a part of. This is a wonderful team, and I'm glad to serve as a part of it. Before Yumi and I started this church, way back when we were still in Japan, and we were just praying about it, and, and we actually had a long list of names, and we were asking people in the United States and our church in Japan which name, and we came up with this foundation is the name of our church, Foundation Bible Church. When we were still, before we even had our very first meeting, one of the things we were praying, well, you know, I was praying for a diverse group. I didn't want all young people. I wanted a, a whole range of ages. I wanted a salt and pepper church, people from different backgrounds, different income levels, all different sorts of people. And one of the things that I prayed about, one of the things that you and I both prayed about, was this kind of friendship, this kind of comradeship, this kind of teamwork, uh, and so blessed to see God answer, being part of a functional team with a unifying goal. You know, that's part of a human need inside of us. A spiritual, a psychological need. I want to be part of something bigger than myself. Aren't you glad that it doesn't come down to just our problems? We can be part of something good, something that God is doing in our community, something bigger than ourselves. Uh, God, I want to be part of something that matters. Tomorrow is, is the U.S. Women's World Cup soccer team's next game. Uh, those of you who know me know I love sports. For me, it's a, it is kind of a spiritual experience. I see people excelling. I think it glorifies God. I love to see the, the teamwork. I love to see uh, the effort. I love to see proud, strong people submitting themselves to a coach for the greater good to work together. Uh, I just love to see a team, m even more than individual sports, working together. And I've been watching several games of the World Cup. This is the Women's World Cup. I'm looking forward to the Men's World Cup as well. I love the Olympics. But one of the things that's been hitting me in maybe the last month, last month and a half, more than before, is how often I hear people talk about the importance of self-sacrifice, leadership, devotion, and togetherness on a team. I heard one of the gals from the U.S. women's soccer team uh, she got emotional, and she was in an interview. She said, this is the finest group of people I've ever been around. I truly trust these girls. And I thought, that's, that's the way the church is supposed to be. Uh, I've been watching some. I've never watched really sports documentaries before. I watched a couple sports documentaries recently, one on Christian Leitner, one on the Detroit Bad Boys. Uh, I think there was, there was one on uh, uh, another basketball one. I can't remember. Uh, in there, and one of the things that kept coming back is uh, in these documentaries is how often 
they said, we felt like a family. We felt like a family. And then, and then uh, a commercial for the U.S. military I saw, and, and they're, they're, they're talking about their preparedness, their equipment level, their, 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 their leadership in place. And it says, join us, the finest team you will ever be a part of. And I heard some uh, police officers, because the police are under a lot of unfair, uh, you know, con condemnation recently, and I heard some police officers defending their team. They said, this is a good team. This is a fine team. I have good people around me. And it struck me that kind of teamwork, that kind of togetherness, that kind of dependability, he's got my back. What is that? You got my six. I know that... My, and now John Cook often says it in a way that is confusing to us at Band of Brothers. He said, we are shield maids. And we think he means shield mates, mates, but it always says it sounds like shield maids, and we, we kind of all go like this. But, 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 you know, the idea of a Roman military wall, in, in, and you've got the enemy bearing down on you, but you've got your shield here, and he's locked his shield here, and the next person up like this, and the next person above like that. If people start running, what happens? gets in there and you're done for but when you can trust the people around you that's a wonderful thing when people are dependable love binding us all together remember that was christ designed for the church before jesus went back to heaven before he actually went to the cross remember he was what he's prayed for he said i want my i want those who follow me to have unity i want them to love and when they love one another then the world will know that i'm in them see what the world sees in a lot of churches is arguing, church splits, fighting. Jesus says the world's going to know it's real when they see us loving one another. So do you think that's important? Got to start loving people. Yeah, loving is, is not always easy, is it? Is important, military, that's important. We have our freedoms today because we've been protected by our military. Police department, so important. Firemen, so important. All these different teams, so, so vital. And yet, as important as those who serve our nation are, listen, you have an opportunity for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, serving on God's heavenly kingdom, serving on God's team, his work in history. What is God doing in history? Even more so. And so much more than a sporting event, even the World Cup or the Super Bowl, so much bigger is the right to be able to serve on God's team. What we do as a team, we commit ourselves, we're going to bring glory to God. Well, what does that mean? Well, I give up the right to throw. You ever watch a sporting event and some player's throwing a, a, a he's pouting on the field? Or he's, he's rebelling and not listening to the coaches and he's off running doing his own? Isn't that, you feel uncomfortable and you're kind of embarrassed for him? You know, uh-oh, the team's in trouble. Uh, listen, when, we, when you become a Christian, do you know what that means literally? It means you've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus bought you with your blood. What does that mean? Well, we don't belong to ourselves anymore. So what does that mean? I have a right to be angry. I have a right to pout. I have a right to be bitter. And Jesus says, no, you don't. You belong to me. Listen, you don't have a right to those things if you belong to the king. We've given up those rights. And so as a team, our job, you know, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is not pouting. Another uh, fruit of the Holy Spirit is not holding on to a good grudge. Th those are never listed among the whole, fruits of the Holy Spirit. What we do as a team is we are committed to bring God glory. I want to make Christ's name beautiful to the people around us. I want to make Jesus Christ attractive with our church. We want to honor God. We want to bring recognition to our Lord. We want to draw all people to him. We want to be hungry for souls. Hungry for souls. Lord, Lord God, please, if you're moving, if you're doing something in our community, we want to be a part of it. Please, please use us. We're here. Let us be your hands. Let us be your feet. Let us be your voices. Please use us to show people your love. We want to show that love is real, that life is more than disaster and suck in air until it's done our mission our purposeful mission not an accidental mission but something we are on target that we've dedicated our lives for as individuals as friends as as families and as a church 
is to reach the entire world with the good news of salvation, that God will love anybody, God will forgive anybody. The blood of Jesus can cover any sin. and We want to do that in our generation. We want to do all we can to reach everyone we can. Let's talk now. Let's open our Bibles now to Luke chapter 5. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 5, 17 through 26. <clears throat> Luke chapter 5 from verse 17. This is a neat section. This is a really neat section of Scripture. One day Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and from Jerusalem, so a lot of people. Jesus is becoming a famous teacher. And so there's, there's these teachers coming to check on him. A lot of people are gathering around. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. The word power here is, uh, oh, never mind, I forgot what it is, dunamis or something like that. Some people came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him to the house to lay him before Jesus. And I read that an average house at that time, maybe, if you're standing shoulder to shoulder and you're a little bit smaller than today's people are, you would have fit 50 people in the home, uh, plus the courtyard would have been filled, everybody within voice uh, if, if, who could hear his voice. So people came, they're carrying a paralyzed man on a, on a mat, on a cot. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowds all around, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, you know, that strikes me. Instead of saying, when Jesus looked up and said, what? What in the heck are you guys doing? It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. That's a wonderful thing. You ever think about that? Your sin is forgiven. We're not Christians because we're so perfect and we always do everything right and we're, we're just the way we're supposed to be all the time. God sees us at our worst. He knows the very worst things we've ever done. He knows the worst things we've ever thought. He knows the way we've spoken to those we were supposed to love. We've treated those around us. God sees all of it. And he says, I love you. Come to me. I will forgive you. I forgive everything. And there's a very famous phrase it says something along the lines of, we should never imagine that the anthill of our sin compared to the mountain of God's love. No matter how much sinning we've ever done, we can't out, out sin grace. All of our sins together, all of the sins in the world put together, still did not overcome the grace of Jesus Christ. He died for the sins of the world. And how do you get that forgiveness? Well, you come to him and you confess your sins and say, Lord God, I see I'm messed up. I know I'm not perfect inside. Lord God, I want to follow you. Please forgive me. I want to part, be a part of you for your family. And Jesus looks at this man. He says, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now listen. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, we always think they're bad guys. What they do here is the right thing in this situation. If you, if you, I don't care how much you loved your favorite history teacher, how much you loved your favorite math teacher or sociology teacher. If, if you filled in your math paper and you got a B plus and the math teacher's putting around the place, uh, Sally, D minus, that's not so good. He, uh, uh, Roger, he goes, oh, Bill, B plus. Your sins are forgiven, my son. You know, there's something wrong with that picture because a good teacher, a good philosopher, a self-help guru, these people, they can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins, right? So what Jesus did here, standing in the middle of all of these good God-fearing Jewish people and all these teachers of the law, they knew their Old Testament ups, up and down, to hear him say, your sins are forgiven. What? You can't do that. Only God can do that. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, has authority on earth to forgive sins. And so he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, 
take your mat and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of all of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home, and he was praising God. You ever read the Bible real quick, and you kind of, he was praising God. I bet he was dancing. He was praising God. He came in there on his back, no hope. He came in there miserable. And he got up. The king says, get up. And he says, yes, sir. He gets up, and he's healed. He's healed completely. He's, he's not only healed physically, but everything inside him. His sins are forgiven. He, God sees him as he is and says, I love you. And he gets up, and he, has a, he gets up to a whole new life. And he goes home, and he's praising God. He's not praising God because some worship leader says, praise God. Yes. He's praising God because guess what? In, in, by the way, what worship leaders are supposed to do and what they're doing, they lead us into God's presence. We see God. We say, oh, he's good. Praise God. Look at what he's done for me. Praise God. Look at the cross. Praise God. Look at my sin, and he didn't kick me to the curb. Praise God. I've got a good God. I've got a God who loves me, and I want to tell everybody about it. Praise God. It's not something you, you just push a button or you do artificially. Okay, praise God time for the next 20 minutes at church. Our life, when we understand who God is, how wonderful he is, our whole life should be a response to his love. Our whole life should be praising him. Everyone, verse 26 says, everyone was amazed and they gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen some remarkable things today. Which strikes me as an incredible understatement, doesn't it? We have seen some remarkable things today. They, they encountered the living God. And when you encounter the living God, it makes a difference. The word for remarkable here is paradoxus. Paradoxus. We, uh, we get our word paradox from that. It, it means here not what you would expect. We came here. We thought we were going to hear from this good teacher. And what we got, boy, you know what? That was not what we expected. This is not at all what we expected. Not just healing a man, which we had heard Jesus was, was, was able to do these things, but claiming to be able to forgive sins. That's shocking. We came here to hear a good sermon. And Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And then he, he gave this stamp to prove that he can forgive sins. He, said, he healed the man. And he, and he jumped up and he went home carrying the mat that he came in on. He came in carrying his burden. He came in on his burdens. He left carrying that old mat that he didn't need anymore. Shocking. And also, it was probably unexpected. And I think this probably made, until the whole your sins are forgiven thing, until the whole uh, get up and walk thing, I think the most shocking thing was they're all standing around there and it's kind of hot and muggy and they're standing shoulder to shoulder so you could jam 50 people in there. It plus the people in the courtyard, they're all standing there, and they see these guys trying to get in from the back. And you know, you're not getting through here. Not with that mat, you're not. Maybe some little kids can get up to the front. You know, you're not getting through carrying. And then they see he's going up. They're, carrying, they're trying to carry him up on a ladder or something. And oh, I got, hope they got that guy tied on there. That poor guy, he's doesn't look in good shape. He's gonna roll off that thing. Look at that there on the roof. They're trying to listen to Jesus, but they're like, what are those guys doing up there? What are those guys doing up there? And then Jesus is teaching, and the dust. And he kind of ignores it. He teaches a little longer. Now he's kind of, you know, he's in, in the Father's, uh, yeah, you know, and now he's looking up there, and then little chunks start coming off, and people are saying, I think they are digging through that guy's house. Do they know that guy? Did anybody give him permission to go through the roof? It's almost comical, uh, right in front of Jesus, in in, in the larger piece of chunk, and then the sunlight is going through the roof. And then that's not enough, because they're thinking maybe they just want to hear better. They're digging out more. What are they going to do? They're digging out more, and then they lower this guy in there. And, you know, probably they had ropes and everything, and they're kind of, oh, no, 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 a little bit more on your side, because they don't want to dump him on the ground. For that's, that's very undignified. And so they're trying to get Jesus, this fella down right, and, and now we've got this shaft of light coming into this, this house. And people are saying, this is a remarkable thing. And the other guy says, Greek is paradoxus. And they're, they're, they're really thinking this is not what they expected to see. No wonder that people left saying, we've seen something unbelievable today. We've seen something remarkable today. There have been times when I've been meditating over this story. 
that it brought me to tears to think about the way these men love their friend. I, I know for years I grew up thinking about Jesus, and I always think in a philosophical bent, and I was always thinking, this is an argument for his deity. Look, he can forgive sins. And that was all right there. And then one day I was at a great commission conference, and he talked about the fellow's friends. I thought, wow. I've been thinking about that in the years since. The love of those friends who would carry their buddy up on top of a roof. Imagine them talking as they hatched the plan to do this. We got to take Jethro to go see this. I, I don't, the Bible doesn't say his name, so don't, don't hold me on that. It, it may or may not have been Jethro, let me put it that way. So, so it, we got to get Jethro over to see Jesus. You know, he's doing all these amazing things. People say is, he has the power to heal anybody. And in the things that he's saying, people are leaving and they've never heard messages like this before. And Jethro, he's always there in bed, he's miserable. Remember when we used to run around together when we were little, before he got sick, before he got paralyzed? Let's take him. I don't know. Yeah, let's do it. You think? Yeah. And these buddies together, they're, they're getting this plan. I wonder if their paralyzed friend also objected at first. Uh, no. No, thank you. I don't want to be the center of attention. I don't want you to drag me up in front of this guy. Who do we know? Maybe he's just some, some fake, some, some illusionist or... Or it's too embarrassing. He didn't want to be the center of attention. I wonder what they thought when they arrived. And oh, oh man, look at the crowds. There's no way we're getting in. Why is he preaching indoors anyways? And look at all the religious leaders that are up front. We're not going to get past. They're not going to let us through. There's no way we can get to them. I wonder which one of his friends said, I'm going through the roof with him. <laughs> Let's take him. Or did they plan that ahead of time? They had ropes ahead of time? Or, or, or they see what the situation is. They said, we've got to get some ruse. We need to get a shovel. Or maybe they didn't have any of those things. They just went on the spur of the moment. These men took their friend. They shed sweat and got blisters carrying that bed. Who knows how far they had to transport him. Transporting a grown man is not easy, an easy thing to do. This was hard work. How did they get through that roof? Did they already come planning to dig through? I guess in that culture, the roofs were, were made of tree branches and, and leaves, and they were stuck, uh, had mud stucco on the outside, so it was kind of like a plaster, and it would harden. And it was so hard, you could walk around up there. You had to bust your way through. Kung, kung, kung. Dirt coming in on Jesus. If they didn't plan ahead of time to get those tools, they had probably had to claw through with their bare hands. Might have been bloody. And you know what? Do you think the crowd down there was just ignoring them? Or do you some people would say, get off of there. Who, what are you doing up there? You think a few people might have said, what are you doing up there? What are you doing? Maybe a few people were irritated. They came to hear this great teacher, and now there's this distraction. The roof is caving in. <laughs> Chunks of dirt are falling on Jesus, and Jesus smiles and wipes it off his hair. They cared about their friend. You know what they didn't care about? Being polite. They cared about bringing their friend to Jesus. They did not care what other people thought. Let me repeat that. They cared about bringing their friend to Jesus. They did not care what other people thought of them. They didn't care that it wasn't what was expected. Well, this is out of the ordinary. This is not what usually happens. They cared about their friend. They were a team. They were united. They were on a mission. I don't know what the crowd thought about them. I do know what Jesus thought. The Bible tells us that seeing their faith, seeing their faith, the faith of friends, he said to this man, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now, it's true. We have to have faith of our own. We have to come to God and have faith of our own. But I want you to notice something. There's a spiritual principle at work. Your faith can result in the people around you being saved. Do you have enough faith to take them to Jesus? Do you have enough faith to share the gospel with them? To share the message of the cross? Do you have enough faith to bring your friends to church? Do you have enough faith to bring your friends to Bible study? Well, what if the people around start to murmur? Oh, we don't do that at church. Though that was unexpected. 
didn't expect. That's kind of remarkable. Who did, who did this guy think he is? You know what? I don't care about the murmuring crowds. I care about my friend, and I want to see him in heaven with me. I don't care about the murmuring crowds. I care about my friend, and I want to see him in heaven with me. Because of their faith, because they were willing to do the hard thing and struggle to bring their friend to Jesus, because of their love, their friend began a brand new life, and he went home dancing. He met Jesus Christ. He was healed. His sins were wiped away. Does that inspire you? Does that kind of faith inspire you? J. Vernon McGee said, some friends of this man let him down. Now, not what you think. I've got to finish the sentence. They did not let him down. They let him down through the roof, right? If you don't take your friends to Jesus, then you're really letting them down. Friends, children, parents, coworkers, neighbors. Some friends of this man let him down through the roof of a house in order for the Lord Jesus Christ to see him. Both Matthew and Mark record this incident. Mark gives the longest account, though this is the shortest in the gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, I, the Lord healed this man because these four men brought him into the presence where the poor fellow could hear, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. It was a wonderful word that came to this man. There are many people who are not going to receive the message of salvation unless you lift a corner of their stretcher and carry them to the place where they can hear the word of the Lord. They are paralyzed, immobilized by sin and by many other things that the world holds for them. They are paralyzed by prejudice and others by indifference. They are never going to hear Jesus say to them, Thy sins are forgiven thee unless you take the corner of their stretcher along with some friends and bring them to Jesus. Is, any, is there anyone that God has placed on your heart during this message? As you've been hearing this message, is there anyone, someone that you think that needs to hear about Jesus, someone that you need to grab their hand and say, let's go to church. We need to get us some Jesus. These men believe that Jesus could save their friend. I believe that Jesus could save me. I believe that Jesus can save you. I believe Jesus can save all of our friends. I believe it. Going back to the video we saw, Penn, uh, Penn Gillette, he asked a question. Here's an atheist who said, I appreciate Christians who share their faith with me. Because how much would you have to hate somebody to believe that heaven's a real place and not tell people how to go there? To believe that eternal life is a real possibility and not tell people how they could get it too? How much would you have to hate somebody not to introduce them to salvation? These men believed that Jesus could share, save their friend. How much would they have had to hate their friend not to do all that they could to bring their friend to Jesus? Think about the things that excites you and I, the things that we just have to tell our friends about. What gets us going? What gets you going? Maybe a Christian book that you've read, a quote from a famous evangelist, or maybe a sermon you heard at church and you just had to share it. How about a favorite TV show? Did you see Howdy Doody last night? No, sorry, I was busy watching Gilligan's Island. I kind of ha- held the phone the old way. I should have gone like this, right? I do that. I talk about TV shows. I talk about The Flash. I liked that show. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's about the guy who dresses in red and runs really fast. Uh, how about your favorite sports team or your favorite superhero? I talk about the Green Bay Packers all the time. Uh, Amen. I should have heard some amens about that. Uh, That's right. A new candy bar. I've talked about candy before. Do you know I've evangelized candy? You've got to try this. It's really good. That's what evangelism is, right? Or maybe a new diet, a new recipe, a healthy recipe. Those things can maybe save us some calories or give us a bit longer lives. You know they can't save our souls or give us eternal life. If I can share a diet, I can share the gospel. Louder. Amen. Amen. What else do we talk about? A funny joke? 
We share our passions, right? If you're passionate about it, you talk about it. What do we share on Facebook or in our emails? Do we talk about movies? Yes, we do, especially at this church. Or maybe there's another way to word it. What would cause you to go out of your way in order to let your friends know about Jesus? Or, or, or to go out of your way, maybe a sale on diapers, you know. Rutherford, I got the modern phone now, see? Rutherford, you got to go get these diapers. Baby or adult, depending on the age, age group of your friends. Maybe a yard sale on yard gnomes. They've got this huge collection of yard gnomes. You've got to see it. You've got to get over there. Would that cause you to, to pick up the phone? What about Jesus Christ died for your sins? He loves you. He loves everybody, and anybody can have eternal life. Anybody can for, be forgiven. I got me some Jesus. You've got to get yourself some Jesus, too. How about if somebody was giving away thousands of free sports cars? Would you want to tell your friends and coworkers, and you're thinking, well, maybe not that coworker, but no. Or maybe for those of us with big families, free minivans. Does that get a uh, you know, different part of our crowd? Free minivans? That would be awesome. I've got to tell you, I don't, I'm pretty easygoing. I don't get offended easy. If they're giving away free sports cars or free minivans, you didn't tell me that would hurt my feelings. Free minivans. Yeah? Yeah. Go get one. Okay. That would be awesome. If someone were giving away free $100 bills and you didn't tell me, I'd think, oh, man. <laughs> Wish you had told me. How about somebody's giving away free Packer tickets? Now we're, now we're getting serious. Have you ever imagined, and guys, I'm not saying this is true. This is not in the Bible, okay? But I want to think, have you ever imagined, what if on Judgment Day, the blood of Jesus Christ covers your sins? You're forgiven because you put your faith in Jesus, okay? You said, I want to stand with Jesus. I want to be part of God's plan. And Jesus said, I died for you. I, I already took care of all your sins. And you're forgiven, and you're there. But then God says, I want you to stand by. And all the people you've known in, their li in your life, I'm going to let them file past you on their way to hell. And they have to walk past you, and these are all the people that you never bothered to share your faith with, who never accepted Christ, and you had to watch them go past you into eternal separation from God. And we, you know, what is hell? It means eternal separation from God, and God is all things good. The Bible says it's a place of regret, of gnashing of teeth, a place of despair. Again, I'm not saying that this is the way it happens, but I have a question for you. If on that day you had to watch people you knew who you never bothered to share your faith with, walk past you in a parade on your way to hell, would it change the way you live your life now if you knew that day was coming? How much worse to say, oh, you're giving away free sports card you didn't even call me? Why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you invite me to church? Why didn't you tell me it was real? Why didn't you tell me God made... All the things that God did in your life, why didn't you share your testimony? Paul, the apostle, said that he wanted to live his life in such a way that he was, his hands were clean of everyone's blood. In other words, nobody is around me can say, I'm guilty of not sharing the gospel. Paul shared his faith with everyone. He did his part. Romans 10, 12-15 says, There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all. There's no difference between Jew or Gentile. In our culture, I want you to put in black, white, Asian, Latino. There is no difference. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call upon him. For everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The Bible doesn't say some of the people. The Bible doesn't say only the really good people. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God's not eager to judge. He's eager to forgive. God's got his arms wide open because he wants to hug us and bring us into his family. How then, verse 14 says, can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? How can they call on God if they haven't put their faith in him? And how can they believe in him if they have not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Well, here's the thing. Jesus Christ, the Great Commission, 
He said, go into all the world and make disciples of all people, teaching them to obey everything I've taught you. We have been sent. We're sent to take this good news out to others, to share with them the love of God. Do you want lovely feet? You want God to say, God, who made all the stars and all the galaxies, all the diversity of life, to look down and say, you have beautiful feet. I love that. You want lovely feet? Walk some dirty roads. Get some blisters. Do all you can to tell everyone you can about the good news of the cross. Brothers, sisters, don't tell yourself you have too many problems. Don't tell yourself you're too old. Don't tell yourself you're too young, too tired, too busy to do all we can to win everyone we can for Christ. It's going to take effort. It means going out of our way. Good thing we're not alone, right? Missionaries, when I was on the mission field, you often felt alone. We've got a team. This is the team that we've been praying for. We get to be a part of this family. We get to be a part of what God is doing. We're, we're, we're going to take some effort. We're going to go out of our way. We're going to dig through some barriers. We're going to break down some walls of racism. We're going to break down some, some, some walls of anger, some walls of bitterness, some walls of unforgiveness. Digging through barriers, some barriers that are just so hard and the world thinks they're impossible to get through. There's no fortress that can stand up against Jesus Christ and his gospel. Has anyone out here, have you been following the news about the, you know, the nine people killed at a church during a Bible study down south? Isn't that horrible? What kind of culture do we live in, right? Right in the middle of a Bible study, some, somebody breaks in and he starts shooting people. I was watching CNN a couple days ago, and they were showing from the court, and I guess the way it was set up, the the criminal, the bad guy, he was up on a video, but he couldn't see the, the people who were talking, but he could hear them. And these were family members of the people, these were families of the people, these people had lost a loved one in the shooting. And also one of the survivors who was in the room and survived addressed this man, his name was Dylan Roof, this terrorist named Dylan Roof. And what they said again and again and again is they gave a testimony of Jesus Christ. And I think it's, it's amazing how out of this dark, horrible, heart, hateful situation, God just grabs the situation and says, I'm going to use this for my glory. My people are there. And these people said, we forgive you, Dylan. And the one fellow says, I forgive you. My family forgives you. But I don't want you to waste this chance. Take this opportunity to repent, to confess your sins, to put your faith in the only one who matters, Jesus Christ, and he will forgive you. And I'm watching CNN, and his message is being broadcast all around the world. I'm glad we have brothers and sisters like that on our team. Another brother, a black gospel singer named Marcus Stanley, he was not part of this situation, but a number of years ago, he was shot eight times at point blank range. The man who did it didn't even know him. It was a gang initiation ritual senseless violence. He was walked up to on the street, pumped through. He should have died miraculously. And I don't use the term lightly. Marcus survived. He still has a bullet lodged near his spine. He still lacks feeling in one arm. He wrote a letter on Facebook, and it got to this Facebook. He wrote a letter to this Dylan Roof. He got to his Facebook page, and he posted this letter, and he got it before Facebook took, took down Dylan Roof's page. And this letter had now has gone viral. It's going all over the internet. Listen to what he wrote. This black gospel singer and this, this man, Dylan Roof, who inexplicably had black friends but said he wanted to start a race war. Don't understand it. I don't think there's any logic to evil, right? Uh, he said, I love you, Dylan. Even in the midst of the darkness and pain you've caused, but more importantly, he, and he capitalizes it, loves you, God. So he's writing to this murderer and said, we love you. If you would like to make that confession, then repeat these words. Dear God in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I acknowledge to you that I am a sinner, and I am sorry for all my sins. So listen, if you're listening today, on television or internet or wherever you hear this morning, you want to become a Christian, pray these words in your heart as I read them, okay? 
and you can come to Jesus and he will forgive you, you'll become a part of the team. You'll become a part of the family. So here's what you got to do in your heart. Listen to this. Dear God in heaven, I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus. I acknowledge to you, I acknowledge I am a sinner. I am sorry for my sins and the life that I've lived. I need your forgiveness. I believe that you are the only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who shed his precious blood on the cross at Calvary and died for my sins. And I am now willing to turn from my life of sin. You said in your holy word, Romans 10, 9, that if we confess the Lord our God and believe in our hearts that Jesus raised him from the dead, that God raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. Right now, I confess Jesus as the Lord of my soul. With my heart, I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. This very moment, I accept Jesus Christ as my own personal Savior. And according to his word, right now, I am saved. Thank you, Jesus, for your unlimited grace, which has saved me from my sins. I thank you, Jesus, that your grace never leads to license, but rather it leads to repentance. Therefore, Lord Jesus Christ, transform my life so that I may bring glory and honor to you alone and not to myself. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me and for giving me eternal life. Amen. And that's the message that got on Facebook, and it's gone viral everywhere. God is seizing from the blackness of hell. God is seizing glory for his name. Brothers and sisters, join that cause. Be a part of this. C.S. Lewis, that great British theologian, that great British writer, he said, when Jesus Christ came, it was like an invasion. It was like Normandy. It was like a beachhead. God is invading this world with his kingdom, and we get to be a part of that. We get to bring goodness, truth, love, forgiveness, mercy, grace. Everywhere we go, we get to be a part of what God is doing. Live for Christ. What other life is worth it? Live for Christ. The world divides black, white, rich, poor, old, young. Jesus Christ unites this is the most important mission we will ever have. This is the most important mission we can ever have. And this is the finest team that we will ever be blessed to be a part of. Let's jump up. Let's get going. Let's get busy. Amen. Foundation Bible Church. Inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.